Well, can it get more cowardly than terrorists using the sick and injured, the most vulnerable as human shields to try and protect themselves from attack? Well, that's what Hamas has been doing. And their whole network of tunnels also runs next to schools with weapons stored in classrooms. And it's why just hours ago, Israeli troops stormed Gaza's main hospital, Al Shifa, in an operation the IDF says is essential to defeat the terrorists who are running their military operations from inside its walls. And this comes after Israel seized key Hamas government buildings yesterday, including its parliament. The IDF said it is now carrying out a precise and targeted operation in a specific area of the Shifa hospital. They say it's an operational necessity and have called on Hamas to surrender. The IDF said that their forces include medical teams and Arabic speakers who've undergone specified training to prepare for this complex and sensitive environment. They say the intent is that no harm will be caused to the civilians being used by Hamas as human shields. And the Jerusalem Post reports that the IDF has found a specially equipped room 30 metres underground where two Hamas leaders, Yahya Sinwar and Mohammed Daif, might have been in hiding. The room is at the bottom of a tunnel that's been captured by the IDF. Now, the White House has also come out to say that it has its own intelligence to show that Hamas has, in fact, been using the Shifa hospital as a command centre. US National Security spokesman John Kirby told reporters on Air Force One that Hamas was storing weapons in tunnels and underneath the hospital. I can confirm for you that we have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad use some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including Al-Shifa, and tunnels underneath them to conceal and to support their military operations and to hold hostages. Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ, members operate a command and control node from Al-Shifa in Gaza City. They have stored weapons there, and they're prepared to respond to an Israeli military operation against that facility. Well, with all the anger and the aggression of the pro-Palestinian protests we've seen lately, it was heartwarming to see this incredible sight today. Nearly 300,000 Israeli supporters marching in Washington. They demanded, let our people go. A reference to both the 230 hostages, including a 10-month-old baby held in a terrorist dungeon, but also, of course, a reference to the demands of Jewish slaves centuries ago, against Pharaoh in Egypt. New US Speaker of the House Mike Johnson told the crowd that calls for a ceasefire were outrageous. This is a fight between good and evil, between light and darkness, between civilization and barbarism. barbarism. The calls for a ceasefire are outrageous. And Israeli President Isaac Herzog addressed the rally by video link. He said, never again is now. He said the march was for the babies, the boys, the girls, women and men who are being held hostage, but also for the right of every Jew to live proudly and safely around the world. Now, as you know, it has felt like a lonely past month and a half for the Jewish community. And each night on this program, I implore the Prime Minister to show leadership on this epidemic of anti-Semitism that we're seeing. Each day he doesn't and the crisis gets worse and worse. The Prime Minister has a particular responsibility to set the tone of what's acceptable in this country. And former Prime Ministers would have shown leadership. They would have come out strongly and taken charge of this unacceptable and despicable explosion in anti-Semitism that we're seeing in Australia in the hearts of our major cities. You wonder if the Prime Minister ever listens to the pleas from our community. Well, today, he was forced to sit there in Parliament and listen, as opposition leader Peter Dutton gave an extraordinary speech, one of the most powerful of his career,
where he demanded the Prime Minister cancel his overseas trip to deal with this crisis of anti-Semitism. He accused Albanese and Penny Wong of speaking out of both sides of their mouth and of failing to protect our Jewish community. Caucus is split right down the middle and the Australian public Order. sees that this is a government where the wheels are quickly falling off. And this Prime Minister is flying off overseas again when he should be staying in this country to deal with the issue. I never thought that I would see in my lifetime a repeat of the horrific scenes that we saw and that we've read about during the course of uh, the Second World War repeated in our lifetimes, but to see people of Jewish faith cowering in their homes, being dragged from cupboards out into the street, when children are still abducted and still held hostage, this Prime Minister needs to stand up and to be united with the Jewish community. And he's not. All right, Australia's former ambassador to Israel, Dave Sharma, joins me now. Dave, thank you so much for your time. What did you make of that amazing speech by Peter Dutton today and, uh, and the people it was directed at, Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong? Well, I'm glad Peter Dutton has called this out, Sherry. I've been saying this for some time now that our political leaders, and they are at the state and federal Labor, Labor leaders, have been unsufficiently clear in condemning what has been happening in Australia, which has been outrageous and intolerable. Uh, and they haven't been crystal clear in their condemnation of that, and they haven't been crystal clear in their instructions to law enforcement authorities to clamp down on this. And now, as a result, as, as the way this has been allowed to run, starting, of course, with the Opera House protest, that disgrace to Australia. Starting with that, we've now got a community here uh, who I know personally, I'm not Jewish myself, but I know them personally, they are living in fear. They, are, they, are, they feel menaced. They feel intimidated. Many of them feel terrified. Many of them feel unsafe. How, how have we let this happen? Well, the reason we have is because our political leaders here have failed us. And Peter Dutton is right to call that out. You wrote a piece in The Weekend Australian, uh, first published on Friday afternoon, where you were critical of Penny Wong. You say she's been missing in action on the Middle East. What are your main criticisms of her and the role she's played? Well, they're twofold. Firstly, her, but also others in the government, have been, as Peter Dutton said, speaking out of both sides of their mouths. They're condemning anti-Semitism, but then they're also condemning Islamophobia. Now, I've only seen evidence of anti-Semitism in Australia. I haven't seen any evidence of anti uh, Islamophobia. If I see it, I'll certainly condemn it as well. But they've been engaged in this sort of, you know, both sides are at fault type of moral equivalence, which uh, has no place given what the Jewish community is enduring right now. But secondly, she seems to think that her role is to just be some sort of armchair commentator and critic, always putting Israel on the dock, uh, arguing that Israel shouldn't be doing this, shouldn't be doing that, uh, often without any evidence, accusing Israel of something that's pretty close to war crimes, which is a very serious charge to be laying. And mm. certainly as the foreign minister, you need to be careful in the sort of words you use. Now, if Penny Wong cares so much about civilian life and the loss of civilian life, then I'd urge her to get involved and do what you know, every foreign minister of nearly every other significant country, often their leaders has done. And go and visit the region, register your messages directly, speak to the Palestinian Authority, speak to Israel's ministers, register what you want to uh, convey. But instead, she's an armchair critic sitting in Adelaide, giving press conferences and scoring Israel's performance. I, I just don't think it's the way an Australian foreign minister is meant to behave. Yeah, yeah, continually lecturing Israel. Now, Dave, what I loved about your piece in The Weekend Australian is that it offered hope. And sometimes it feels like there isn't much hope at the moment. But you write that Hamas's defeat, and surely there will be a defeat, that this defeat could set the stage for a broader peace effort and a final resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, take me through your thinking here. Well, I think it's important to understand, Sherry, that Hamas has been an obstacle to peace since it was created nearly 30 years ago. You know, Hamas aligned people were behind the first intifada which derailed the Oslo process. Uh, they were involved in the second intifada after the Camp David summit. Even when I was in Israel in 2014, the last major peace effort in the second term of the Obama administration, negotiations were happening between the Palestinian Authority and, and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his government. Progress was being made. That all came to 
a grinding halt when Hamas kidnapped and murdered three Israeli teenagers and started a war against Israel. Uh, and I think you're seeing a pattern here. Israel, uh, Hamas just started this conflict almost certainly to disrupt an Israeli-Saudi peace mm. effort that was underway. So if you believe in peace and if you believe in a better future, not only for the Israeli people but also for the Palestinian people, then Hamas has to be vacated from the scene. And the quicker that Hamas can be defeated militarily and removed from political power, the quicker we can have the Palestinians governed by an entity that at least recognises Israel's right to exist, at least is not committed to the extermination of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. There is a prospect then for negotiations and talks. And Hamas has been an obstacle to this now for since its creation, since it was first set up. And the quicker they go from the scene, the better the future can be for Israelis and Palestinians. Yeah. All right, Dave Sharma, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it.